So good afternoon, good, well, good afternoon from here in Austin. Um, good morning for those of you in Australia and good day for everyone else. Um, uh, my name is Keith Hawkins. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I changed the title at the very last minute uh, Galact on galactic archaeology, the prospects for chemical tagging. Um, but I also really want to take a moment to also thank um, not just the organizers, but also the Galat team and all of the teams of large spectroscopic surveys and astrometric surveys that really found, form the basis for not only the results that are being shown here, but also many of the results from yesterday as well. It just would not happen without these large international groups of people working together, um, not only on collecting the data, but also on making sure the data is, is, gets to a science product uh, at, the, at the very end. So I wanna thank everyone uh, for that as well. Now, generally speaking, I. Um, whenever I give lectures, I oftentimes uh, have to start out with what galactic archaeology is. I don't think I have to do that here because I'm talking to basically the world experts in galactic archaeology, and I feel very honored to be um, um, at least presenting all of this stuff to you all. Um, but I do want to frame at least some of the big questions that I am interested in and that set the tone for my own research group. So I'm interested in galaxy formation and, and how galaxies form, how they assemble, how they evolve. Uh, in particular, um, how they're structured as well. Uh, and the Milky Way, as we all know, is a wonderful laboratory for actually doing this type of work. It's a wonderful laboratory for answering questions of galaxy formation because it's the closest thing to us. And so we can see the Milky Way, we can in map out individual stars um, and their detailed astrometric, photometric, and, and kinematic and chemical properties that enable us to answer these questions at a high level of detail. And yesterday we heard a really nice um, um, talk in the, in the earlier session about how this is being pushed beyond the Milky Way in 1031, but at least at the, for the time being, the Milky Way really represents one of the best cases, uh, one of the best laboratories to do this. But that doesn't come without challenges, of course. Um, we sit, live inside the Milky Way, so we have somewhat of a skewed perspective of the Milky Way. We haven't never, of course, gotten out of the Milky Way to take a picture of it. In addition to that, there's hundreds of billions of stars, so we can't observe all of them. And so we have to make choices as to what to select, and that creates all kinds of selection biases. Um, the Milky Way is also just a jumbled mess of all kinds of things like dissolved clusters and associations that are phase mixing, have either phase mixed or are phase mixing now. Um, you've got radio migration, uh, basically taking stars from one birth radius and moving them in and out of the galaxy. You've got uh, internal or you've got external systems, like we heard yesterday, the Gaia Ensolata system that is accreted and phase mixed into the Milky Way. So it's, it's really just this jumbled up mess of stuff. And so the question is, how can we um, take this jumbled mess of, of junk that is the Milky Way and piece together or uncover um, the assembly history of the galaxy? And so the ways that there's many ways to do this, but the ways that I'll focus on in my talk are the two that I've been most interested in, which I call the, the tagging tools, um, which are dynamical tagging, which people oftentimes forget about, and chemical tagging, which is what we all really are quite interested in, especially because GALA was largely created um, for the purposes of chemical tagging. And so I'll talk a little bit about dynamical tagging and mostly put that aside, but I'll, and I'll focus most of the talk on chemical tagging and some of the work that we've been doing to figure out if it works or not. Um, <clears throat> And I just want to highlight here that um, chemodynamic tagging, which is the combination of the two, is actually an would be an extremely powerful thing to do, uh, but we just need to get a handle on the uncertainties. So I hope to, to convince you at least that chemical tagging may be possible. Dynamical tagging, it's a little harder, but it still should be possible. But chemodynamic tagging really should be the far future of, of what we're aiming to do. Um, dynamical tagging is this idea that you can, um, with sufficient information about a star and the Milky Way, you can actually back orbit integrate the star and figure out exactly where it was born. Um, and so that's dynamical tagging because you are dynamically integrating an orbit and figuring out where the star was born. Uh, but it requires a lot of really important things and difficult things at that. So it requires accurate and precise phase space information for all the stars. You need to know where the stars are and you need to know how they're moving. Now, uh, you also need accurate ages. So you need to know how long to integrate the star back for. And then you also need to know an accurate information about the Milky Way's gravitational potential at all times in the orbit so that you know what the star has felt and what torques it's felt and what forces it's felt. Um, and that's really hard. Um, so, you know, the, the course Gaia is really helping with the first. We have phase space information for a billion stars. Um, but many of those stars actually have very poor parallaxes. And so the phase space information is somewhat 
not so greatly under control. Uh, in addition to that, we ages for individual stars is extremely difficult to measure. So how far are we going to integrate the thing backwards? And, and, and like worse yet, the gravitational potential is not well known, especially at all epochs. And so dynamical tagging is a really difficult problem. However, people have done it. So this is an example um, from Lee et al. 2012, where they actually do dynamical tagging of hypervelocity stars. These are the, some of the fastest stars in the galaxy. I've been very interested in them. And I, I bring this up as an example because I'll talk about hypervelocity stars a little bit later. Um, this is an example of where folks have used uh, dynamical tagging to try and figure out if um, hypervelocity stars, which are pictured here, uh, they backwards orbit integrated them to see if they come from the galactic center. Right, which is where the thought blue formed. Um, so that's dynamical tagging. On the other hand, chemical tagging, which is what I think a lot of us are really interested in, is a slightly different idea. It came around, as far as I understand, in 2002 from the Freeman, Bland, Hawthorne, at least that's the one that's cited the most, most often. So um, very connected to Australia, of course. Um, and so the idea is pretty simple. You have two, imagine you have two gas clouds on different sides of the galaxy or different radii. Those gas clouds form stars. And then of course the gas clouds will disperse over time due to diffuse processes. And then the stars will interact with all kinds of junk in the disk. They'll interact with giant molecular clouds, they'll interact with, this, with the spiral arms, they'll interact with, uh, potentially resonances with the bar, and they'll get completely phase mixed throughout the Milky Way. And so the question is, can you actually figure out that all the blue stars were born together, and all the orange stars were born together? Because if you can, then you can actually uh, tag their birth locations and reassemble the structure, the, the history of the, of the Milky Way. And so the idea is that you take a spectrum of star one and a spectrum of this star, and you realize, okay, those stars have different chemistry, therefore they're not born together. Um, but if you take a spectrum of the two blue stars, then you can figure out what their chemistry was exactly the same and therefore they were born together. Okay, so this is the idea of chemical tagging. It's like, you know, this one is like 23 and me for the stars essentially. So it's a pretty cool um, idea and, and I really like it uh, as well. Uh, but there's a question of does it work? And if you go to the literature, there's, there's lots and lots of debates about this, you know, uh, about whether chemical tagging will work. But just to give you an idea, some of the, the requirements of chemical tagging is that stars that are born together must be homogeneous, chemically homogeneous, because you're using the chemistry as the tag itself. In addition to that, stars born together in one location have to be uniquely different than, than chemically than stars born at different locations. And it's that uniqueness that's also important because you need to be able to tell that something was born at say radius nine kiloparsecs and radius eight and a half kiloparsecs. Um, and so this, there's been obviously a lot of debates in the literature, you know, for example, Hogg 20, uh, 2016 says chemical tagging can work, whereas Blanca Charisma 2015 says that it can't, who knows. Um, so oftentimes the literature is kind of diverged into the flavors of chemical tagging, that there's a strong form of chemical tagging, which might be tagging where a star comes from exactly based on this chemistry or a weaker form, a weaker limit where you can tag that it either came from a globular or tag that it came from say some bulk component of the Milky Way. Uh, and so a lot of my group uh, has been working on trying to figure out, okay, does chemical tagging work? Can we say that one of the, at least one of these requirements is indeed satisfied in the universe? And so that's basically like asking, are stars born together, like these two stars here that are born in this wide binary system, are these two stars actually homogeneous chemically or not? Um, and of course the answer could be yes, it could be no. And if the answer is, it is assumed to be yes, not just for chemical tagging, but also for things like exotic star characterization. I think of M-dwarf as exotic stars, for example. Um, so M-dwarfs are, you know, for, for many of the spectroscopies in the room, in the room we know M-dwarfs have uh, molecular bands and our understanding of molecular opacities just really isn't quite there. Uh, and so they're really difficult to measure. And so what people will do is they'll find an M dwarf in a wide binary pair with an FGK star, they'll measure the abundance of the FGK star, and then they'll assert that the M dwarf has the same abundance. And of course, this is used a lot now because the exoplanet community is looking at M dwarfs. It's also used for white dwarfs and other types of stars as well. So if the answer is yes to this question, great, we're good. Uh, if the answer is no, then we actually kind of have a little bit of a trouble here because we're, we're, we're assuming it to be yes for lots of various things. Um, and so in pops a nice study from O, Samuel O in 2017, where she found a set of co-moving pairs with uh, essentially wide binaries um, with Gaia DR1. And um, this was actually at the Flatiron. I was at the Flatiron at the time. And I remember uh, turning to John Brewer and, and John was saying, oh, I have spectra for these stars. It was completely serendipitous. So John had a nice spectra from high res on Keck, I think. And the chemistry, the, this is showing you a plot of the X over H ratio for different elements of one star in the wide binary pair in blue and the other in red. And so in principle, if, if stars born together are chemically homogeneous, the red and the blue should overlap, they don't. 
Uh, and in addition, they also said in this particular paper that um, the refractories are the ones that are enhanced, and so that might have indicated kind of engulfment. And so this really kind of concerned me when I when I saw this, like, oh, you know, maybe chemical tagging can't work. Uh, and then Hogg's paper came out and said it could, and I was like, oh my goodness, what are we doing? Is, can it work? Can it not work? What's going on? Um, and there's there's lots of literature. I've just pointed you to some of it, and I've put specifically I've put dot dot dots before in the end because there's a lot of literature on this. These are not the only studies on this, but I just wanted to to say you can you can use one of these studies to, to jump your way to another one. Uh, and in fact, actually, um, uh, Jeffrey wrote a nice paper in 2018 where he actually did the same thing, but instead of uh, using say Keck high res, you could actually use Galat to do this. And this is actually showing you a distribution of the difference of elemental abundances uh, for um, 11, I think, wide binary pairs or co-moving pairs. I think it's from Samuel's paper, but I can't remember exactly, but it's a set of, of, of uh, co-moving pairs from Gaia. And if highlighting here the, um, the distribution, this is the distribution of the difference in metallicity between the two stars in the pair. Um, if the pairs were in fact chemically homogeneous, it should be peaked and very narrow at zero. In fact, it has what I remember reading this paper and thinking, oh, the dispersion is a little larger than what I would expect. Uh, and this was just an 11 pairs. So, so we're moving from one pair from Simingo's paper to 11 pairs with Jeffrey's paper. Um, and so when I moved to Texas about two or three years ago, we said, okay, let's see if we can do this, but now do this for 25 pairs. So we, so we obtained spectra, high risk spectra from McDonald Observatory for 25 wide, wide binary pairs. This is the 2.7 meter that we used. This is our workhorse instrument. Uh, and this is the one of the wide binary pairs. And we explicitly uh, chose those pairs. This is a CMD of the pairs, uh, each pair in a, um, kind of connected by a line. We specifically chose pairs that were very close in temperature space. So we can um, absolve any kind of systematics or reduce the systematics. Uh, and for the spectroscopists in the room, I thought I would show this plot because when I saw it, I was like, oh, great. Um, so each, uh, each, this is the spectrum in the, just before the main, uh, in the 4,800 to 4,900 angstrom window um, of four wide binary pairs. One star is a solid line and one star is, the other star is a dotted line and each color is a different pair. What you can see from a, spectros from a spectroscopic perspective, there's almost zero difference between many of these wide binary pairs. There are some, but generally speaking for many of these pairs, we saw absolutely zero difference. Um, and that's kind of highlighted here in this particular um, plot, which is showing the dispersion of the difference in the, in the X over H ratio for different elements for all of the wide binary pairs in uh, red triangles compared to random pairings of field stars and orange triangles. And we also, for reference, put in the what we, how well we think we can measure the uncertainties um, in red circles. And what's important here and the takeaway from this plot is that the red triangles and black circles overlap, which means that within the uncertainties, we can't see a difference between the chemical abundance patterns of the wide binaries and uh, and or each pair in the wide binary, whereas we can for the random pairs of field stars. So we wrote this paper, you know, identical for turtle twins, the chemical homogeneity of wide binaries, and found that in general, most at least in, in about 80% of the cases, this pair seemed to be um, homogeneous at a pretty high degree. Uh, and I'm actually a twin, so this happened to be kind of a nice little press story. Uh, this is me and my twin brother. Um, and so we decided to extend this actually. Uh, so I have a student, Tyler Nelson, who actually worked in collaboration with Wan Su Ting and Alex Chi, and we collected high res spectra from Mike Magellan of uh, wide binaries. But, in, but instead of just collecting wide binaries, so this is showing you the difference of metallicity for a set of wide binaries in my study, uh, in the study from 2020, uh, we actually extended the separation. So we, uh, what I initially naively thought was as, you, as the stars become further and further apart, you have more of a chance of, of chance alignments. And so that means that the, this, um, you would tend to see less homogeneity. So in this plot, you might expect to see in this diagram here, uh, the stars would be centered at zero, but with a very, very large dispersion with that dispersion increasing uh, with, decrease, with increasing separation. Um, but that's not what we found. So Tyler actually studied instead of 25, he's expanded the sample to 40 wide binaries and found that in fact, the, the co-moving pairs that are at, you know, Tend of, ten, tens of parsecs, which are not even down anymore, are just as homogeneous as the stars chemically, or as, as nearly as homogeneous as the stars that are separated by just 10 to the 3 AU. I mean, so this was kind of a surprise to me. But then there was some nice uh, simulation work done by Harshal Kunar, which showed that uh, actually this is not actually super unexpected from simulation. Simulations expect the conatal pairs can be separated by as much as uh, tens of parsecs. Um, and then uh, um, Kate Daniel, myself, and a few others had organized an, As uh, an Aspen summer conference. We were actually, I was actually physically in Aspen uh, at my first in-person conference uh, last week. 
Um, and um, I started talking to people there and realized that I don't think anyone has actually done this with a lot. So over the weekend, uh, I just quickly put something together and found that there were more than 100 co-moving pairs in Gala that have chemistry with detailed, uh, you know, good chemistry from Gala. So this is a factor of eight to 10 more from the, from the original Simpson paper and those Gala sample, uh, that Gala sample is now shown in green and it overlaps quite nicely with that original sample, the, our original sample of just 40 pairs, but now this is 100 pairs, uh, almost 100 pairs. Um, it's a little bit um, more- five minutes. Thank you. It's a little bit more dispersed, but um, that's expected because, uh, again, the, the resolutions are a little lower and potentially some noise. But this is something worth following up and something that, I'm, that we're kind of thinking about doing in our group. So now that we have an idea, so chemical tagging probably could work, I'm going to spend the last five minutes uh, focusing on what my group has done with chemical tagging or chemistry in, involved uh, or in, in chemistry. Uh, and so one of the things that we did uh, in, back in 2018 with collaboration with Rosie Wise was looking at hypervelocity stars. Um, for those of you who have known me for a long time, I've been interested in these things for a long time. I actually did an REU project about them when I was an undergraduate. Um, and uh, so hypervelocity stars um, are these really unique stars that are moving incredibly fast, thousands of kilometers per second. The idea is that they're formed from a, 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 a triple body encounter between a binary star system and the black hole at the center. One star gets captured by the black hole and the other one gets ejected at an enormously high velocity, so-called hypervelocity stars. Um, and so this is how they're thought to be produced. They were first discovered in 2005 observationally. Uh, and uh, one of the things that has happened though, is that as time has gone on with Gaia and other surveys, uh, folks have actually been able to dynamically start tagging these things and find that they don't come anywhere near the galactic center. Um, and so that's kind of a problem because they're thought to be produced there. So there's a nice paper from Douglas Bow who finds that maybe these stars are actually runaway stars from the Large Magellanic Cloud. And so what I realized was, of course, the Large Magellanic Cloud has a very different set of chemistry than the galactic center, right? And so this is the Tinsley diagram, the alpha metal C diagram that we all know and love and that, and that we saw a lot of yesterday. And so the idea is that if hypervelocity stars really are coming from the galactic center, they should be drawn from this black curve. They should be metal rich. They should be enhanced in their alpha abundances probably. Uh, but if they're coming from the LMC, they should probably be metal poor and much lower in their, uh, in their alpha enhancement. Um, and so Rosie and I did a nice, uh, we did a quick um, kind of pilot study of five of these things discovered in Gaia DR2 just to see what would happen. And what this is showing you the, the data on calcium over iron as a function of metallicity for these five uh, hypervelocity star candidates in black compared to the disc, the bulge, and the LMC. And the important point here is that uh, these hypervelocity star candidates don't seem like they're coming from the LMC. They should be down here. They don't seem like they're coming from the galactic center. They should be up here if they were. Uh, they actually just look like normal halo stars. And so what we argued in this particular paper is that um, these stars are actually just the highest velocity tail of the stellar halo. They're not coming from the galactic center. They're not coming from the LMC. Um, but we need to figure out if that's true for the typical hypervelocity star. And so we have an ongoing survey uh, with Rosie and others uh, looking for um, whether or not this is true or not. Um, the second example I'll, I'll give in the last couple of minutes here is um, something that we've been working on just now, and that is on these young stellar streams that are being discovered in the galactic disk. We're using chemistry to try and understand these streams. Uh, and so this is an example from MindGas 2019, where they, uh, with the exquisite Gaia data, they were actually able to show that if you look at the V5, VR, VZBR, or VZV5 diagram, you find these beautiful overdensities in the kinematic spaces. In particular, they found a particular overdensity in kinematic space where all the stars were moving together. Um, and this was undiscovered before. And if they plotted this up in, in X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z space, which is shown here, they found that this, this structure is a 400 parsec long string of stars. Now, whenever I think of streams, I just think of the halo. I don't think of streams in the disk. So they found this in the disk, the stream of stars that had these knots in them. And maybe this suggested that maybe stars were forming along these filamentary like structures. Um, and they age dated it to about a gig a year using isochronal ages. Um, but what we realized is that you can actually study the detailed chemistry and not only figure out if it's chemically homogeneous, which again is goes back to that question, are stars born together homogeneous or not? But you could also use um, the chemistry to map the age as well using lithium. And um, so this is uh, work that we did in, uh, last year where we actually derived the abundance patterns of these of, of this particular very long stream and found that it's actually very homogeneous as this is a metallicity distribution showing that it's uh, homogeneous at the 0 0.04 dex it has a dispersion in the metallicity of about 0.4 dex and in addition to that we also use lithium abundances which we heard of a lot yesterday lithium is a great indicator of youth 
uh, we actually were able to show that the lithium were significantly enhanced. So this is the lithium as a function of temperature for the galactic disk, the Hyades in purple and the Pleiades in red and the Pisciardonis stream, the, the stream in black. And so we found that it was actually very enhanced in lithium or not lithium enhanced in like terms of the lithium rich giants we talked about yesterday, but enhanced enough in lithium for dwarf stars that they were actually considered uh, very young, 100 million years old. Um, there's a lot of these streams have been discovered uh, over the course of the last year with Gaia data. And so um, we now are using Gala data to try and figure out the chemical abundance patterns of those streams, those newly discovered streams and their lithium abundances. I'll leave it to Catherine Manea, who's speaking in, later on in the session about that. Uh, and I think I will just leave up my conclusions. Just the key takeaway points here is that um, one is that chemical tagging may work. Uh, however, we need to figure out how strong one can apply it. And that's really gonna depend on not just looking at stars being born together, being chemically homogeneous, which I hope I've convinced you that generally speaking, they seem to be, um, but it's also gonna depend on the, the, how unique they are chemically across the galaxy. And I uh, refer you to a paper from Melissa Ness on, on chemical doppelgangers. And the second takeaway point is that chemical tagging uh, can be applied to many different things. It can be applied to solve the origins of open of, of um, uh, hypervelocity stars or or these young solar streams. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, so we have time for a couple questions. Uh, we have a question here in the chat from Gayandi da Silva asking, comparing the wide binary samples in the plot with Gala stars and your samples, where you have different spectral resolutions, how accurate do you need the abundances to be to have a final say on chemical tagging? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, trying to figure out how the, so you can already see at some level, although it's a little bit difficult to see that the Gala uncertainties, the green crosshairs here are the actual error bars and they're a little bit larger than the error bars on the blue. And that's largely due to resolution and, and signal noise and potentially other effects. Um, the real uh, way to figure this out potentially is going to have to be to normalize by the uncertainty. So what we did in, in Tyler's paper, for example, was look at the difference divided by the by the uncertainty, uh, normalized by the uncertainty, so that we can see if um, if the dispersion was due to just the uncertainty or if there if we actually were resolving astrophysical dispersion there. Uh, it might be the case that the Gala sample may not have the the uh, high enough precision to be able to say it, to, to be able to say that these things are homogeneous at the 0 0.03 dex level, but it might be that we could say that they're consistent at the, they're, they're homogeneous at the 0 0.08 dex level, and that can be helpful alone. Um, and again, of course, sample size also helps as well. Remember, we started with just one wide binary pair and, and moving up and up and up and up and up to hopefully thousands of wide binary pairs. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that. Yeah. Cool. Um, we have a raised hand from Dennis Dell, and this is going to be our last question. So if you have additional questions for Keith, please put them in the Slack. So Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so quick question on that plot you have there. Uh, what's the physical um, reason for the gap at the 10 to the 5? Lack of yeah. time. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. We're still trying to figure that one out. Um, there, it's not likely to be anything astrophysical. It's probably due to selection. Um, we think it might be due to, so this is uh, Kareem al Badri's work. Uh, we take Kareem al Badri's catalog of a million um, wide binaries and co-moving pairs, and we cross-match that with the Galat catalog. So it could be that at that, there's somewhere in that particular range, there either aren't a, a great number of pairs in the original catalog, in the original wide binary catalog from, from Kareem, and that's something that, that we're looking at now. Again, we only did this on the weekend. Um, uh, or it could be uh, just a result of convolving the selection function of Gala with the selection function of Kareem, uh, Kareem's paper. So um, it's likely one of the, I think it's likely one of those two things. I don't think it's astrophysical by any means. Uh, my original hope was we saw this gap in the original data set. The goal was to see if that we could actually fill that gap in. Um, I was hoping that Gala would fill it in, but unfortunately it didn't. 